please join me in welcoming your moderator and this impressive panel. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. A big thank you to Aspen Ideas for focusing on young leaders this week and to Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for supporting this morning. Um, good morning to all of y'all. We're so grateful that you have joined us. I am thrilled to have a panel of incredible young leaders who are already making change in global health right now and who clearly will continue to do so throughout their careers. Um, I think, needless to say, over the past two days, it's pretty clear that we are in a breakthrough moment when thinking about um, accessibility to health and equity in the United States. And um, it's certainly a sea change moment, and I'm excited for us to talk through um, what these four young leaders see in the field of global health now and how they want to be working on the issues that they're working on moving forward. Um, we will have time for audience Q&A, and so please think of any questions that you have for our panelists, and we'll make sure to get to you as we get closer to the end of this session. Um, so to begin with, I'd love to introduce our fabulous panel. To my left is Elsa Marie Da Silva. Um, many of y'all probably heard her big idea at the opening yesterday. She is the managing director and co-founder of Safe City, which crowd maps sexual violence in public spaces in India and Nepal. To her left, she's also an Aspen New Voices scholar, fellow, yeah. fellow. Um, <laughs> to her left is Abraham Lino, who is the country director for the American Refugee Committee and the DRC. He's a 2015 Aspen New Voices fellow. Abraham has worked with refugees in emergencies and communities over 15 years in places such as North and South Sudan, Ethiopia, Pakistan, Liberia, and Congo. He himself is a refugee from Sierra Leone who is using his experience and his humanitarian work to ensure that refugees live beyond surviving to thriving. To his left is the one and only Estefania Palomino, who is a human rights lawyer from Colombia. She is currently a Global Health Corps fellow working with the Global Division of Planned Parenthood, supporting advocacy strategies on reproductive health in both Africa and Latin America. And our last panelist is Brian Murphy Eustace. He is the Director of Operations for the Ebola Response for Partners in Health, which is an NGO dedicated to the mission towards global health equity. He is splitting his time between Liberia and Sierra Leone, working on the Ebola response. He's also a Global Health Corps alum. Um, and prior to joining Global Health Corps, he was the founder of a public health consulting firm that focused on emergency preparedness, response, and project management in cities in the United States. So please join me in welcoming these fabulous four young leaders. Um, needless to say, each one of them is working on one of the most urgent and salient issues of our time. And so to begin with, I'd love if each of them could tell us um, if they think knowing the information that they know and seeing the work that they see on the ground, um, do you think that we're in a particularly challenging time in global health and on the issue that you focus on specifically and why or why not? I'd love for you to start, Elsa. Good morning, everyone. Um, you know, we are in the 21st century and we are still talking about sexual violence, which you may have heard what I said yesterday. To me, that's totally unacceptable, especially when countries are actually thinking of going to Mars and inhabiting it. For us, if 50% of the world's population do not have a safe environment to live at home or at work, or even in public, that's totally unacceptable. And in today's day and age where we have technology to make it really transparent, to connect each of us, I think we should be able to use it, leverage it, and make this gender-based violence a non-issue. Thank you, and thanks for the warm welcome. Uh, just looking at the audience and all of us seated here, you can see that the world is a global village. Um, I work in Congo, I work with refugees, and as she has said, uh, our moderator has said, and health travels. Issues around health go beyond a single border. So just like refugees travel, health issues travel. And today there's a lot of coverage, media coverage on uh, migration, immigrants, and refugee issues. And the sooner we, or the more and better we can understand how to deal with refugees, how to 
uh, program around refugees and respond around refugees, especially in regards to health, we're not just saving or helping them survive, but we're also protecting the environments that they come from as well as the environments that they live in. Well, thank you very much for your warm welcome today. Um, I work in, in a division that has programs in 10 different countries in Latin America and in Africa. And certainly I can see a worrying trend against sexual and reproductive rights of women and girls. And one thing that I have observed in my work is that patriarchal notions or cultural notions tend to inform the decisions of policies and regulations about women's health, especially in developing countries. So, for example, I recently was following the campaign de Jalea Decidir in Peru that allow victims of sexual violence, which is a topic that Elsa is clearly working very hard on, uh, that allow victims of sexual violence to access uh, safe abortion services. And what we saw in that, in that campaign and all the, legisla the legislative process that followed was that uh, policymakers wanted to enact laws that were informed by their own beliefs or by their own uh, th thoughts about what the role of women and girls are in their country. So I think we are in a especially challenging place right now for women and girls. Uh, thank you all for, for welcoming me as well. It's really exciting and a blessing to be a part of, uh, of this festival. Um, <clears throat> I think it is a, a challenging time. Um, more than that, I think it's really a, an exciting time. Um, you know, over the last 50 years, there's just been such tremendous advances in, in modern medicine that we see uh, at this point, I think, uh, the vast majority of tools that are needed to, to address you know, the majority of health ills throughout the world that we see. And so, um, you know, for me, it's not so much, the, the biggest challenge is not so much the, the ideas or the innovation, but rather the access to, to these things, to these, these incredible tools that we have. Um, you know, there's, there's communities where we work, uh, many of us that are just marginalized and really uh, held, held uh, away from just the tremendous amount of resources and tools that could really address the, the, the health and social ills in these communities. And so for me, you know, uh, it's funny, I, 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 in touring some of the facilities recently, um, we're, we're sort of looking at, at helping to increase the uh, infrastructure in some of the health facilities in West Africa. And, uh, you know, just, just a couple weeks ago, I saw um, uh, in, in one of the laboratories, the way that they're using, uh, th their centrifuge is just a vice attached to a chair that they kind of turn. And uh, they're sterilizing, uh, people are sterilizing um, surgical equipment in a rice cooker in the courtyard. And, and I'm not suggesting that these innovative approaches to health are, are, are broad ideas that should be adopted, but rather there's not a lack of innovation. Uh, there's, there's really incredible people and, and ideas being put forth and working, but it, there's just a laxus to the, the tools and the resources to really, to really be able to address that. So to me, I think that's, that's the biggest challenge. And I was hesitant to come to, to an Aspen Ideas Festival and, and share this idea of, of not a new idea, but rather <laughs> access to new ideas. But, but I think that that's really a key. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, I guess to build off of that, since you have been focusing on West Africa for the past several months, especially in an emergency response manner, um, I'm curious, in addition to access, what are the weak links that you see? And um, for all of us who haven't been to West Africa right now, or reading about it, or sadly not really reading about it in the media anymore, um, what do you think the situation is like in Liberia versus Sierra Leone? Yeah. Uh... I mean, so aside from just the, the resources in, in, in other countries that could, could be shifted, um, you know, human resources within these countries are, are, are just uh, uh, need of, of sort of a, a, a reinvigoration, if I can say. Um, you know, there's, I think the, the, there's varying quotes on statistics, but in Liberia, a good example is that there's, uh, by most accounts, I think prior to Ebola, there was 50 doctors in the country, and that, that's one per 90,000 population base. And so um, then when you think about the, the effects that Ebola has on healthcare worker infections and, and, and what it's done to the human resources, let alone nurses and pharmacists and, and, the old, and, and, and hospital managers. And so, um, you know, uh, we talk about the four S's, staff, system, space, and stuff, and, and I think, um, the facilities that I see in West Africa are some of the worst I've seen in the world, and, and, and I think that there's 
a, a hope for me is that there's sort of, in addition to shifting of resources, that some of the existing resources can be reallocated towards long-term development. Ebola was an infection that sort of preyed upon a fractured health system, and to not address that root cause would just be a repetition, I think, of what we've seen. I, I would love to see, you know, the, the, the investment and the interest put towards long-term policies and systems that would really change those root causes so we have greater human resources, we have better space, we have more stuff. Awesome, agree. <laughs> Estefania, so you are a human rights lawyer and you've been previously focused on reproductive rights in your own country of Colombia and now you're living in the United States for the first time. And I'm curious your thoughts on the current trend in reproductive health access in the United States um, and the differences or commonalities between reproductive health access in the U.S. and Latin America. Thank you. Well, I think that when we're talking about human rights, especially human rights uh, treaties or regulations, uh, we tend to think that the U.S. is somehow away from different trends and from different things that are going on uh, in other parts of the world, especially in developing countries. And I think uh, right now we're observing how the U.S. is actually joining um, a very bad trend uh, against uh, the sexual and reproductive rights and health of women and girls. And just since January, we have been observing uh, the enactment of 29 different regulations that restrict access in one way or the other to safe abortion and that are included in different types of bills, bills from education to human trafficking. So these are the same things that are going on in developing countries. And one of the things that uh, caught, caught my attention is, is that uh, most of the people don't perceive this as a threat, a threat for public health. And if you observe what has going on in uh, many other countries, such as El Salvador, you could see that restriction of sexual and reproductive rights has serious consequences. So we see in countries like El Salvador, uh, women that have been in jail for mon more than 15 years because they have survived a miscarriage. And those trends towards uh, restricting sexual and reproductive rights, um, it's something that we really have to look for. We have to spot them and we have to ask uh, policymakers and legislators to uh, take into account the needs of uh, women and girls. Um, so Abraham, what are some of the biggest misconceptions people have when it comes to the needs and opportunities of people living in refugee and crisis settings? What have you seen in your work? Thank you very much. Well, let me start by saying refugees are good people. <laughs> <laughs> and um, well, I could name a lot, but I will give you three. One, refugees have a very definite definition. By, given by the UN. It was agreed by all countries and they define who a refugee is. But what refugees are not, they are not economic immigrants. I think there has been a confusion. Uh, there is a lot of coverage around what is happening also with immigrants uh, on the Mediterranean Sea and uh, all that is happening around immigration, even in the US borders with uh, uh, their neighboring countries, Mexico and all those places. Refugees do not sit down to plan, to calculate, and uh, you know, go to family members and say, I'm going to collect money, and when it gets to 4,000, I can pay you know, a bus driver to take me across the border. No, they don't have such a plan, and so they are not economic immigrants. Another thing is, the refugee problem is not a quick fix problem. Uh, very often, we treat refugees as though uh, it's, it's just there and it's gonna finish tomorrow. That's not true. I'm a refugee myself. At 16 years old, I went through a camp. But unfortunately, some of the people that I grew up with, I ran along with them, fled the conflict. Since 1991, some of them are still in camps. Mm -hmm. I've seen the same in Pakistan. You can go to Somalia and Kenya. There are still the refugees there uh, over 20 years. You go, you know, we, we thought the situation in Syria, OMS, you know, it was just going to be uh, one week and then everything will stop. Today we're counting over a million and a half uh, refugees that have fled into other countries. 
So we need to put in our mindset that it's a long-term problem. The programming around uh, refugees and will change from being the short term to looking at their long-term needs. And the last thing I want to talk about is uh, refugees are people, and every human being is a complex being. We all have, it's not you know, one size fits all. Mm -hmm. um, as a 16 year old running from a war, I was looking, my parents, I ran with my parents, and they were looking backwards. You know, my dad was concerned about his houses or, or property that he had lost, uh, his friends that he has lost, all of the things that he left behind. I was like, my dreams, you know, everything that is in the future. Where are my dreams? How do they fit in this context? What am I going to be if I stay in this place? So we have to start looking at, let's put it in terms of curtailing, like uh, sewing for the person. The same can happen in health, because very often we see that even the health that is provided in refugee camps or refugee situations uh, is very general. It doesn't address, at the time that I ran, probably mental health was the most uh, mm -hmm. sufficient thing that I would have needed. Mm -hmm. But it was not even there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Elsa, gender-based violence, we know, is a global issue. Um, for example, in the United States, 20% of women have been sexually assaulted or face sexual assault. What do you think is needed in order to turn the tide on gender-based violence, and what must change in order for us to see a difference? So gender-based violence is actually a global problem. I'm from India, and a lot of people, you know, when they hear the work that I'm doing, immediately reference the horrific rape that happened a couple of years ago in Delhi. And they think that India is, you know, a very violent country. It is, to some extent. But, you know, this is a global issue. And according to UN Women, one in three women around the world experience some form of sexual assault at least once in their lifetime. That's one in three women, every third woman. And in my country, I know for sure that's much, much higher. You know, in the workshops that I've done, every single woman has said that they've experienced some form of it. Less than 10 have said nothing's happened to them. I was in Sweden a couple of years, a couple of months ago, and over there, women were talking about sexual harassment at the workplace and domestic violence. And Sweden, to me, is a very gender egalitarian country, and it should be the shining example for the rest of the world. So I was really shocked. So it's a global problem. But the issue is not visible because as women and as girls, we don't really talk about it. And why don't we talk about it? Because there's so much of shame involved. We internalize it. We constant, when it happens to us, we kind of blame ourselves. We try to you know, justify what has happened to us in several ways. Uh, were we in the wrong place at the wrong time? Or was it uh, the clothes we were wearing? Or did we provoke the incident? And we internalize it. And I found that in, you know, because we don't talk about it, we always think that we are alone. But once we talk about it, we realize that actually there are so many of us facing the same thing. But if only we could talk about it, and if only we could share these experiences. And I think what I'm trying to do with Safe City is create that safe space where you can connect with each other and know that you're not alone. Give you the confidence that since you're not alone, there are others like you, it's not your problem, it's, it's, hap it's somebody else's problem, but you are the person bearing it. So, you know, you can stand up for yourself and confront. It's not easy, but we'll get there. Mm -hmm. We'll get there through conversations. And I think it's very, very important to include men and boys in the conversation because they absolutely, some of them have no clue that this is what we face. I mean, after my talk yesterday, a lot of men also came and said, you know, thank you for the work you're doing. But one in particular actually wanted to know why, why is it that, you know, men are not included in the conversation? And so in India, we now have workshops where we include men and boys. And we feel it's absolutely critical because it's not just a woman's issue, it's a society issue. Mm -hmm. And I think as a society, we have to deal with it. So if a woman is being harassed and you as a person observe it and you see that she's not reacting, don't assume that she's okay with it. You know, because she, you know, there's a study that proves that when women face sexual violence, they actually freeze 
and they cannot react. And later, they can't justify why they didn't react enough, uh, fast enough, and therefore, you know, the silence just prolongs. So if you see a woman being harassed or somebody doing something that's not appropriate, please intervene, please try and step in, please try and avoid it, you know, prevent it from happening. So we also encourage bystander intervention. And I think going forward, uh, more bystander intervention, more transparency on the issue, more connection amongst women as well, and intervention from men and boys is going to help us sort this out. Absolutely, well said. Um, so needless to say, this panel is a panel of young leaders who I would argue are pretty remarkable and already owning the spaces that they work in. And Global Health Corps, the organization that I run, was founded on the belief that um, by bringing great young talent to the field, we can see greater solutions more quickly. Um, our, our organization is a launching pad for great young leaders, and Brian and Estefania have both been part of it. Um, and yet, it's still uh, pretty rare to have a panel like this of young leaders at, um, at bigger conferences. And so I'm curious, from you four, do you think that young people still struggle to be taken seriously? Um, they struggle for opportunities to work on social change issues, or are we past that? And do you want to start us, Estefania? Yes, I do believe that there's a struggle in there. I actually have a story when I was, uh, just a couple of years ago, I was accompanying a client to a court, and we were going through some files, and then the judge looked at me, and uh, looking at me being a young woman, he said to my client, well, I didn't know you were bringing your daughter today. <laughs> and so, yeah, I laughed a little bit, but then I thought, well, this imposes a new challenge because it's not only about being young. In many countries, and I think also in the US, it's a matter of being young and being a girl uh, or being a woman. And so there are a lot of uh, prejudice or preconceived ideas of what this means. And I think uh, more often than never, um, policymakers or people that are in positions of power that can either elevate your uh, commitment or that can just uh, uh, harm your movement, perceive you as a person that falls into those categories of being young, naive, or uh, if you add the gender issue to that, being also soft and not tough enough for the job that you're doing. So I think that one of the solutions for that is definitely connecting and being part of communities that value the fact that you're young and that you have um, the strength and uh, the motivation to uh, achieve change. And one of those communities is actually Global Health Corps. When, yeah, when I uh, joined this uh, beautiful family, I just learned that it was a place where being young and having new bold ideas, ideas that perhaps weren't uh, part of the status quo, were, was what, what the community wanted and was a place, a safe place where you can really um, have a platform to extend your commitment towards global health. Excellent. Abraham? Yeah, um, I would start with a point. Um, I think there are many of us in this group that would uh, agree to the fact that we are technologically challenged, if I would say it in a very moderate way. Uh, what might be very difficult for us in terms of manipulating technology and all of those things might be a very easy thing for a three-year-old, a four-year-old today. Uh, so by us looking at the health space generally was uh, a very secret place, and it is still a very secret place. Uh, but it didn't have a lot of involvement of youth. Now that the world has changed and all, most of the innovators are maybe the 17-year-olds, we need to find a place for them. Mm -hmm. And in health, in technology, I work with health uh, 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 folks. In a clinic that we uh, helped to build in Congo, that IDU.org actually helped us to, to brand and build, we were looking for nurses. We found very capable nurses. They were level A in Congo. But none of them could turn on a computer. None of them. So we had to hire them three, four months ahead 
to even train them how to start a computer, start Word, things we take for granted. So it is about time that we start to you know, bring these communities together. It's happening. There's an opportunity in developing countries because they are opening up technologies, opening up uh, data. There are guys you know, who are making apps in Kenya. You know, there's a very you know, sense of uh, technology growing in, in Kenyan communities, and they are producing apps and all of those design. Uh, folks that can design you, we're working with idea.org and their designers to help us even live in that space where it's, it's not just the building, it's not just the, the facility where you go for help, but it's the person itself. So I think uh, there's an opportunity, but it's yet to be cultivated mm -hmm. to the extent that we need it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> to build on that, India has a huge youth population. And uh, when it comes to gender-based violence, we have adopted a strategy where we are trying to involve a lot of youth, make them aware of their legal rights and the issue in particular. And we use technology to do that. So we get them to ring fence an area, select an area that they would like to work in, get them to deep dive, collect a lot of data on sexual harassment, and then analyze it and find out what are the issues in that community that is causing you know, women and girls to feel unsafe, and then brainstorm ideas. We don't tell them what are the solutions, but they come up for themselves in that community. And some very interesting you know, ideas have come out of that. So for example, we involved a group of young 13-year-old girls, and you know, we explained uh, you know, what is gender and sex, and, uh, the cultural norms and attitudes that need to be challenged. And now they are standing up for themselves and questioning their parents when you know, their parents have double standards with their brothers saying, why do they have different, uh, a different yardstick and why is it a different yardstick for us? And why can't we do the same thing? And in another community, uh, you know, these uh, young people crowd mapped an area and we found some hotspots. And one of them was this hotspot where uh, women were getting uh, molested because they didn't have access to a toilet. But when we zoned into that space, we found that there were actually toilets available. But they were under lock and key because the municipal authorities did not really want to maintain them. But armed with the data, they went to the municipal authorities and pressure them to actually make the toilets available. And so now, you know, they don't really have to get assaulted when they, you know, go to the forest area or the bushes to relieve themselves. So I think involving youth is critical because they are willing to adopt technology. They have an aspiration for a better life. And, um, you know, we can harness that power. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So it sounds like it's not only about bringing youth to the table, but also diversifying the skill sets, data, technology, you mentioned design, IDEO.org, and I know folks from math are in the room. Um, and Brian, obviously you don't have a medical background. You're working on systems breakdowns. And I'm curious what skill sets you need at the table um, or you hope will come to the field of global health in order to ensure that there's equity and access. Sure, yeah. I mean, I think um, I was actually speaking with someone recently and kind of laughing about it a bit. I, I came sort of from the private sector over into, through Global Health Corps into uh, you know, into partners in health, and I was sort of uh, struck by how uh, how discussion-based decision making is in, in nonprofit and in global health work, and um, you know, there's significant advantages and disadvantages. And I think, um, to me, what what I've learned, you know, over the years is there's just a massive need for effective communication for. Uh, the ability to kind of draw people into an idea to do effective coalition building around an idea to push it forward. Um, you know, technical expertise is really important as well, but I think um, what we found is I've seen a lot of great technically sound ideas just not, not launch, not, not kick off, and I think a part of that is in the articulation and the, and the coalition building. And so, um, you know, I, I share the, 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 the same sentiment that the, the critical nature of, of involving youth, and I think there's just not enough opportunities, people around the world, young people I see all the time are so thirsty to, to affect positive change in their communities and I think, um, you know, have these skills, are really effective at communication. I mean, we think about the modalities of communication that we see today from Twitter. I mean, people are communicating nonstop and it's actually really interesting to see the level at which I'm constantly impressed. Uh, I went to a, a community in, in rural Malawi about, six, no, about a year ago actually now 
that um, we were discussing about building a new health center and the, the community came out and uh, among its elected leaders was like somebody who couldn't have been more than 18 years old that was representing the entire community around the, 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 the construction and the development of, of a health facility because of his ability to communicate or because of his education. And I think if there's a way to, to kind of harness that, I, I, we're seeing it now and, and there just needs to be more opportunities. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Do you want to jump in? You're good? No, he's just fine. <laughs> okay. Um, well, with that, I wanted to open um, the, our time up to audience questions. I know there's mics in the back of the room, so if people have questions and you can raise your hand, then someone will run a mic down to you. Um, and I'm happy that I see two questions, three, qu yay, yay questions <laughs> um, right there. Hi, I'm Risa Lavizo Mori, and you are an incredible group of leaders who are clearly going to make a difference on the world stage. At our foundation, we're really trying to put together programs that will enable you to do what you want to do even better. So my question is, you know, what would you wish you could have to further the kind of work that you want to do? And uh, give us some advice on how to, how to make what you're doing even better, as fantastic as you are. Well, I'll start. For sure, I need to reach as many women and girls as possible. And we've set ourselves a target of a million over the next five years. I know it's, a too, it's long, but you know, it's something that you know, I aspire to. But if you can help me reach them faster, definitely that's something that I, I really would like to. Uh, technology is one of the ways that uh, we are exploring, but in India, you know, it's not homogeneous. There are so many layers. People are literate, illiterate, urban, rural. Um, there's language issues. So we are experimenting with different kinds of technology. So we have the website uh, which crowd maps sexual violence. We have a voiced, a misdial facility where people can call and it gets disconnected. We call them back. So they don't even have to pay for a call. We are building out a voice-based system and we are building out a mobile app. And of course, uh, we are partnering with several other NGOs and community groups so that we can reach out to as many people as possible. But, uh, you know, we'd like any help if you can give it to us. So I can build on that. Um, technology is something that we uh, all, I think, would share. But um, I would say I need a voice. Yes, I have a very big voice, but I need a voice. <laughs> and what I mean is, you know, audiences like this, opportunities for us to be able to, to share our passion and share real life stories about real life people. Um, what I want to focus on really is we need to build a lot of local ownership. I think it's an important part, thanks to new voices for bringing us together, <laughs> Aspen New Voices. Thank you, and I'm saying this because it's, it's, it's true. I, I've been doing what I've been doing for over 15 years, but I've been sitting in my refugee camp, I've been doing that in corners, and I wouldn't have been here if that opportunity was not given. So we need to be deliberate in uh, making sure that we find people and give them a voice. Uh, that also goes to programming. Most of what our work has been leading to, it's very good, the humanitarian work, but it, it seems to be a little bit very foreign. If you go into a humanitarian setting, it's the white cars that are imported from Japan or the USA. It is having, there is a huge gap between the service providers who the SPACs with the community. And I think we need to bridge that gap because that's the point where we have been failing, that we don't leave a lot of connection behind. I think the previous uh, uh, panel that was here talked about how do you build local systems, because when humanitarian actors, when development partners leave, most times the activities or the implementation collapses. So we, want, we need to be deliberate to engage local community, be uh, you know, active in, in, in cultivating sustainability right from the onset. Uh, I, again, it might be that I'm promoting a lot of uh, IDEO.org, but we have deliberately as an organization decided to use human-centered design in our approach because it is important that what we do for the people to, should be about the people. 
And so I think it's something that I encourage that others should also do. It brings value and it brings life to what we, we all, you know, the impact we want to have. Yeah, and I, I, I totally agree with that. And I think, um, you know, I just look at, if you think about some of the things of, of that we're discussing today about really young, innovative people coming together around, a, uh, around different ideas from very diverse backgrounds, creating spaces where the, those people can communicate, providing uh, accompaniment, uh, providing uh, teaching and training, uh, career mentorship. Uh, there's uh, just a, a lot of those needs. So if you're thinking about ways to take, I mean, really young people with tremendous ideas, a lot of it is just access to that, that creative space, access to ongoing mentorship and community. Um, the things that I think Estefania and I have found um, in Global Health Corps, but there's just a, there's a, a, it's a limited space right now. And if, if you're engaged in that, I think that's so exciting and I commend you for that. And if there's a way to continue programs like that, I think providing people with, with opportunities to come and, and, and learn from each other and from, from others and experts that have come before them. I don't know if the moderator is allowed to answer the question, but I'm going to just to build <laughs> off of that. Um, we, and this is something that y'all are already doing, but we have been really grateful um, to get to work with Robert Wood Johnson Foundation on creating spaces for our Global Health Corps fellows. So they work in six countries right now. East Africa, They work in countries in East Africa, Southern Africa, and the United States, and they're from 20 countries. And for us, it was critical to have a global group of young leaders working on global health issues. And one of the really powerful pieces that has come out of convening our fellows is this idea exchange from across cultures and across countries. So for instance, we have fellows working in Newark, New Jersey, applying a community health worker model that our fellows had perfected in Rwanda. And just creating opportunities for that dialogue to be shared, you realize that we can jump forward more quickly. We obviously do not have the answers in the United States, but we're often always working with folks domestically or not from other countries. And I think um, we will see rapid uh, improvement quickly the more that we can have this type of dialogue. Another question up here. Um, this is an awesome group of human beings, so congratulations <laughs> for getting here. Um, so all of you are working on pretty complex health issues. Um, not that there's a simple health issue, but we have everything from sexual violence to sexual reproductive health, Ebola, and refugees. And these are often issues that have a lot of stigma. And you know, you all are working for NGOs because you are trying to offer a service or advocate for human beings who are not being provided adequately by governments. So I, I feel part of, it's, part of it is a youth question, also part of it is a, a question about your role in your organization, but um, I feel a lot of what you're doing is probably speaking truth to power. And as a young person, or when you're engaging with young people in your organization, how are you making sure that their voices are not shut down and that they're able to successfully advocate for better health outcomes in their communities? Excellent. So, yeah, I would love to take that question. So I think there, are, thank you again, you're also an awesome <laughs> human being, which is also <laughs> part of our program. And, and so I think there are two parts of that, uh, of that question. And the first one is speaking to power. I definitely think that one of the roles of the NGOs nowadays is not only to provide services or to uh, connect people so they can get the care that they need, but also ho hold governments and states accountable. So if you have to sue them to do that, then you go and do that. So <laughs> there, are, there are many strategies uh, in legal advocacy so that governments understand that yes, we are working as NGOs to make a better place, the world a better place, but also you as governments and as public authorities have a responsibility and the human rights treaties or commitments that you acquire are not just paper you have to actually implement whatever it is that, that you said. And the other question, uh, the other part of your question, which is how do we uh, actually lift the voices of the people that we're serving? So I think there's, uh, it requires a, a tremendous amount of compassion, uh, trying to connect to the people, even if you are serving thousands of people as uh, uh, fellows at Global Health Corps are doing in different organizations. And you have to go one by one, and then you have to reach out to, to the community so you can 
uh, lift their voices, you have to do that. Uh, because actually it creates more compelling stories. If you're talking about legal or communications advocacy, it creates more powerful messaging to send to governments or relevant stakeholders. So it's definitely a need uh, that we have to increasingly explore. At Safe City, we've created a very participatory model. It's not my issue, it's everyone's issue. And we are creating a place where they can participate and actually do something. So if you want to blog, we have a writer's movement. It's completely run by the volunteers. If you want to tweet, our account, which is called Pin the Creep, is a curated <laughs> account. Every week, any person, man or woman, can take over. And for a week, they tweet as Pin the Creep. And we've had. Supreme Court lawyers, we've had climate change experts, urban planners, 15-year-old students, housewives, social entrepreneurs, and all kinds of people talk about gender-based violence, but from their lens. And it's really revealing and uh, insightful because people talk about it from so many different angles. And it helps create the conversations that we hope will you know, get women to break their silence. Our data that we collect on our crowd map is actually free. Any NGO that wants it, so one of the big NGOs in Delhi asked us, can you share your data, data set for Delhi? And we said, of course. So we gave it to them for their Delhi campaign so that they could better understand what people were reporting. But uh, you know, there's a lady in Cameroon. I met her at a conference. And the next thing I know, she's put on her LinkedIn profile, volunteer with Safe City. And she's mapping violence in Cameroon using our site. Mm -hmm. So you know, we have created a platform where you don't really have to be even formally affiliated with us. If you want to be part of the change and the movement, please join in. Excellent. Questions back there and up here. Many questions. It, it seems like one of the, the human resources that are being wasted at the moment are the millennials of America. Um, I have a habit when I go anywhere to buy anything, whether it's Starbucks or a restaurant, I ask the wait person what their background is. What do they do when they're not serving tables? I have yet to be served by someone who doesn't have a bachelor's degree. And there are so many people, I know someone who just took a job who has a master's in women's studies who just took a job at a clothing store in New York folding clothes. Is there some way to recruit? There's probably a million millennials in the United States who are underemployed or who are in jobs that, this is a generation that supposedly is searching for meaning. It seems like you could recruit literally millions of volunteers who would be willing to be on their cell phones for hours a day communicating with people in these different places, helping them, being mentors. I don't know, some way to recruit. It just seems like this, we always talk about wasting natural resources. It seems like that the human potential of millennials in America is an incredibly wasting human resource. Is there any way you could crowdsource some of the services you provide or something to get people to volunteer their time? It's a great question. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, if I would. Absolutely. Answer, I think, um, uh, it has to be a culture, and I'll speak a little bit on the American side of it. We need to go back to our families and build a culture from our families, culture of sacrifice, culture of working together, culture of giving. Uh, I know it's happening a lot, but that comes. You know, it's not very easy. My work for eight months in a year, I'm actually not with my family. I'm traveling in different places, and that requires a lot of sacrifice. Um, it's not something that you can teach. It has to be groomed, it has to be, so that's why I'm going to families. And once that grows into the person, there are opportunities. Our organizations have uh, places where you can volunteer, even in the United States, where you can start you know, a process of going to, through our headquarters and volunteering and being on a list when an emergency arises you can be posted into those areas. They can, now with the you know, technology, you can even volunteer to do something online while you're still in your home. So using that time, that wasted time or spare time, 
to be able to contribute, either say something, write something, connect with somebody from another place and see, you know, create that space that is not just physical but also virtual that people can be able to uh, contribute into. Yeah, and I think, you know, I, it's interesting. I think there is something kind of unique about the, this generation that we're seeing in terms of the thirst for, for meaning in their work, right? Like, I think back about my parents and, and the work that they did, and, you know, they held, you know, uh, admirable professions, but a job to them was really to, to provide for their family, to, to survive, to work. I mean, they, 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 their parents were the great, you know, depression, you know, families, and, and so this, this generation, I do think, is seeking meaning constantly in their work, and, and if I can share, I mean, I, I think there are opportunities, and there's not enough of them, for sure, and I think there is a lot of people that are seeking that. I, I myself was an example of one that was really seeking the opportunity to, to shift my focus uh, into something more meaningful. Um, but that being said, if you think there's a lack of opportunities among, uh, you know, young Americans, it's, yeah. it's incredible how many amazing and talented young people are in, in West Africa, East Africa, all over the world that have even fewer opportunities. Um, you know, this partnership model, not to, to plug GHC too much, but the, the partnership model of taking somebody from a place where there is such a lack of resources, which, which is a, a sort of a, a developing nation, and, and a place like America, and pairing that model, people not, not just to bring those ideas together and have that intersection, but to actually create more opportunities for, for, for people that, that where there isn't that same, same level of opportunities is, to me, a, a model I'd like to see more of. I'd, I'd love to see more opportunities sh shifted, even, even recognizing that there's not enough in America for young people that want to seek meaning. Agreed, just to piggyback off of that and not, not to plug Global Health Corps all the time, but <laughs> why not? We have an audience. Um, <laughs> we, I mean, we started Global Health Corps really in response to seeing this huge opportunity of talented young people that could address social issues. And for us, we can't grow quickly enough. We accept 2% of the people that apply. Um, and all of our fellows are 30 and under, so it's very generation specific, very much like this panel, thinking about if we can get great talent now what will they do with their career solving challenges? Um, but for us this year, it was really interesting. We had 16 positions open for young Ugandans, and 1,000 young Ugandans applied for those 16 positions. And you think about how much talent there is in that group of 1,000. And so needless to say, that motivates us, because we know the more great talent we get into this field, the more quickly we will be able to solve health challenges. So we'd love to plot with you about that. Um, I think we have time for one more question, and I think it must go to Peggy Clark, probably. <laughs> um, thank you guys for a wonderful, wonderful panel. Um, what does my generation not get? Okay, you're talking about women's health issues, you're talking about refugee issues, not just the people who don't understand your issue, Elsa, of harassment, or your issue of creating humanitarian responses that are uh, dignified, but the people like me who've been working for decades on these issues, but I have a new feeling that you guys see things differently. So what do we not get? What do you want to say to us that makes you really angry about the issues that you're working on that we don't understand that you see differently in your generation? That's a very, uh, <laughs> it feels like I have to critique you. <laughs> You're brave, brave, brave. <laughs> Which is very uncomfortable. <laughs> but, I would, uh, but I would say, um, I think sometimes what we do not see or we do not get from, I would say, my, our parents or our parents' generation is listening. You know, um, we have the saying, uh, you, don't, you don't teach an old dog new tricks. <laughs> and sometimes that comes also when it comes to programming. Uh, we have fixed ideas, and it applies also to how we uh, have implemented you know, humanitarian programs and development programs for a very long time. We sit down behind the desk. We write our proposals. We have a set of goals, objectives, indicators. You know, I've memorized that stuff because you needed it to get a job. <laughs> but then you bring that into the field, and you have no, you've not left enough room in your mind to listen. You've not left enough room in your mind to change. So flexibility. Uh, if our parents or people in my parents' generation can give themselves the room to be a little bit flexible and take on the idea of the new design age, you know, and let's all be innovative and creative and have fun in what we do. 
echo what uh, Abraham just said. Your generation has wisdom and experience. And I think ours has the advantage of technology. And uh, if we can marry the two, you know, the wisdom and new ways of doing things, hopefully we can create a better world. I would say, yeah, not to critique older generations. I mean, we are standing on the shoulders of giants. And we are definitely working on what you guys have already built. But one thing that really makes me angry, and <laughs> <laughs> because you asked for it, and uh, definitely it's uh, something that we are observing nowadays more increasingly, is the fact that you don't only have to look at your work, because you, you work with uh, very difficult issues, but also you have to work uh, to look at the people that are against your work. And uh, these people are organized, these people are organized around the world, so the people that you know, have stigma against uh, refugees and that want to enact policies that, uh, uh, for example, uh, create policies that harm them in, in any way are not only located here, are located abroad, and they're all connected. The same thing with sexual and reproductive rights and the same thing with sexual violence. So we can, we have to stop looking not only at our work, but also at the work of the people and the organizations that really oppose and that are pro-stigma, you could say. I think maybe if I could almost shift the question a little bit, I think young people right now have almost the power of naivety. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think some of the, the, the problems I see are so deeply rooted and systematic and structural, and, and to, they'll take 50 years to, to even crack or get, a, get some headway on. And some of the young people working on it is, is probably because they, they're not even thinking that, about that. They're seeing the issue in front of them, they're feeling the urgency and just responding for their community. And so uh, it's not so much that they're, I, I think that's a discernible difference sometimes you see. I mean, some, the, the weight of understanding everything and the experience of knowing, oh, you can press over here, but it's just going to pop out over there. You know, I think almost the, the, the lack of that knowledge is in some sense is a, a strength. Um, Excellent. So we're going to do one last rapid fire question to end on a high note. And that is, um, when, you, when each of you dr imagine a dramatic positive shift in global health in the next 10, 20, or 30 years, what does that look like to you? You want to start, Brian? God, do I have to start? I, I don't know. 30 years from now. Um, what do you hope to see? I hope to see mainly the, the, the piece I kind of touched upon first is, is a, a, a greater push towards equity and, and social justice and, and the way that we think about health care. Uh, how we can find ways to take already the tremendous, you know, ex uh, expansive amount of ideas and innovations and, and use those uh, in a more just way, uh, to, to find ways to shift them, to think uh, for the novel approaches to be that, to be implementation science, to focus on how we, how we shift that, how we bring that access to folks, because uh, we have the tools. It's, it's, it's entirely possible to, to really combat most of what we see in terms of uh, sickness and and ill around the world, and, and uh, it's exciting. It's an exciting time, and I think we're on that path, and I would love to see, to see that happen over the next 30 years, to take the energy that's happening here and that excitement and shift it. Excellent. Yeah. Well, in the next 30 years, sexual and reproductive rights are going to be binding human rights. <laughs> in the next 30 years, I want to see deliberate actions to understanding refugees and programming uh, towards them. Uh, there is already a shift, which is that traditional refugees are reducing the number of refugees who cross into different uh, nations. The shift is that there are more and more internal displaced persons. But our society, our programming has not shifted. We have not changed our idea of this cyclical, the short term, the three months programming. In the next 30 years, I want that to change. Excellent. In 30 years, I would like to see a world where women and girls are truly equal partners in society in every way. And I believe if we have to get there in 30 years, we definitely have to urgently do something right now. And of course, gender-based violence to be a non-issue then. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.